Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And today, more than ever before, companies, brands, and their partners need to stand for something beyond the bottom line. I've created this program to provide insights and ideas to share with you so that you can apply them to your work the very next day. The goal here is to up-level your purpose and to benefit companies and society. So please join us. This is a special podcast interviewing two previous guests on the show uh, talking about COVID-19 and how are they responding to it, providing information and guidance. The first is Just Capital and their CEO, Martin Whitaker. And then the second is Reba Dominski, and she is Chief Social Responsibility Officer for U.S. Bank. Let's talk first about Just Capital. I'd love to read this from the Just Capital website because it really, it sums up Uh, where we are. This is a a once-in-a-generation movement. It's the opportunity for all CEOs who have pledged their commitment to purpose-driven leadership and serving all their stakeholders to put these values into practice. Adopting a stakeholder-oriented response to this pandemic is key to minimizing its public health and economic impacts and will help companies bolster their resilience to weather an economic downturn. When companies provide paid sick leave, workers can stay home and protect their customers and the community from the virus while also maintaining their economic security. When workers are fairly compensated, they can continue to buy the products they need, benefiting the overall economy. When companies prioritize customers' health, and meet their changing needs. This better serves Americans and strengthens customer loyalty. When companies recognize the importance of maintaining the financial stability of their suppliers, local communities reap the benefits. And when business executives lead by example, by reducing executive compensation and companies pursue creative frontline job solutions like shift sharing, we can minimize job losses while restoring trust. Welcome Martin and then Reba to give us insights during these trying times. Can you explain for our listeners what was justness prior to COVID-19? And now what are you seeing as the shift in justness during COVID-19? Overall, it's not changed. Justness was always for us defined by the public and, uh, you know, really covered how well companies were addressing the need of different stakeholders, um, first and foremost, their workforce, their customers, the communities where they operated, the environment, and of course, their shareholders, uh, including how well they governed and their leadership. So those things have all been put to the test, obviously. Um, you know, we see this as a, as just a, a huge moment for, um, for, for shareholder primacy and stakeholder capitalism in sort of immediate uh, juxtaposition. Um, what we found is during this crisis that workers and um, to, a, to a lesser extent communities, but workers have been on the front line. You know, right. we're celebrating essential workers. Mm-hmm. We're, 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 you know, the heroes right now are the folks driving the, 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 the trucks, the grocery checkout clerks, the cashiers, I mean, all the frontline workers that we had been tracking, obviously, before, 
But the crisis has just thrown everything into sharp relief. And so these things that we, we're measuring now, we think have become a lot more important. There are certainly every company we talk to, every investor we talk to, um, you know, social, human issues have become a lot more important. So I think this is a real turning point. That is really important for those, especially those workers who are basically invisible. You know, we took them for granted. And, you know, now when I go into a grocery store, I mean, I'm asking the checkout clerks, how are you? Um, and, you know, and they're so kind and they're so, you know, how are you and have a good day. And so um, it, it truly has made a significant shift um, in terms. I know that the business roundtable declared um, stakeholder based capitalism um, critical. This was about what, a year, year and a half ago. And then when that came out, um, some people said, you know, oh, it's just window dressing. And some companies were doing well and some weren't. Um, I know that they just made another declaration. They sent a note to the White House. Can you talk a little bit about the business roundtable and what was in that note? Well, the business roundtable, it was August last year when they came, when they basically backed a, a, a restatement, if you will, on the purpose of the corporation to create value for all of its stakeholders. And they named them, as you just suggested, you know, workers, communities, supply chains, um, as well as their, and their customers, of course, and their, their, uh, uh, and their shareholders. And, um, you know, the, as you said, there was, there was, that was sort of viewed from, Depending on your perspective as, as great leadership to actually come out and, and make, you know, put a stake in the ground or as sort of like a vacuous empty commitment words only. I think what we found right now is that this is the, this is the litmus test for that. You know, if you, if you are not able to, to really stand up and be counted in the middle of this crisis, then when does it apply? So, this is the moment where a real commitment to uh, a, a stakeholder-based purpose for the corporation is now really, really exposed. And, you know, I think what we've found, BRT's leadership on this has been, I think, really commendable. I think it's very important that now become a North Star for so, business performance. Okay, so let's talk about your North Star, because you came out with your five just leadership principles related to uh, COVID-19. Can you talk about the five leadership principles? And then I want to get into your trackers and perhaps um, ask you what companies truly are living those principles. Well, we, we uh, just, just to back up a second. So what we began to do immediately was using our, our overall framework to track what companies were doing in real time, protecting their workers, and investing in other other stakeholders and after you know we really began to see a huge amount of of action and uh, a lot of it was incredibly positive you know real leadership from the corporate community so i just want to call that out and you know and sort of acknowledge that what we found since then is we took a much deeper dive into the 100 largest employers and we began to track them across 15 or 16 very concrete elements of uh, their response to the crisis. So things like, is a company providing extended paid sick leave? What is a company doing on layoffs? And we're tracking all of this and we're updating it actually very soon to, to increase the number of companies that are included in the tracker and also expand the number of, of, of issues and things that we're tracking. To our knowledge, it's one of the, the, the most comprehensive and up-to-date databases. It's it's totally public um, to see w what's happening. Now, from that, we're able to extract five leadership principles, which we felt um, really encapsulated how companies could respond in a in a strong way during the crisis. And the first is for companies to support workers' health and financial security. Um, and I'll run through them all, and then we can we can we can uh, drill down into some more detail. The second was adopting practices to minimize job losses. Um, the third is putting workers first, and and working with policymakers and government to do that. 
Um, the fourth was supporting communities, local suppliers and customers. And then finally, the C-suite leading by example. And by that, I mean things like, uh, you know, a senior executive adjusting salaries, foregoing bonuses, things like that, which incidentally, uh, at Just Capital, we've done the same thing um, in order to get through this crisis. So we, we felt as though those were, those were essential elements of a, a, a strong corporate response um, during this period of crisis. And I can go, go down to some of those in more details if you want me to. You know, who are standouts? Um, what we're seeing is a, a lot of companies are either, if they've got frontline employees, they're raising their salaries, they're giving bonuses. Um, they're, they're also doing other um, actions to get PPE out to the marketplace and such. But who's a standout for you? Who's really innovative, but it's also, it's, it's a large commitment versus some of these token commitments. Yeah, so I, I, I want to go back to something you just said about the workers and your sort of your acknowledgement of of what they're doing right now. That that is all really important, but what it has to come down to is are those grocery staff, the people you just you know recognize now. I mean that that they they need very concrete things: benefits, compensation, cash, pay. They need their jobs secured. Um, they need extended paid sick leave. So those are concrete things that we think now are just really important. And the stronger re the relationship is between companies and their employers uh, and their employees, you know, we think that really drives greater resilience uh, for a company. So, so anyway, I, I, you know, in terms of real leadership that we've, we've seen, what we found is one size here does not fit all. Companies are all in very, very different situations, level, varying levels of crisis response. Some are fighting for their survival. Cruise line, or if you're a, an airline, then it's all about survival of the organization and jobs. And others are in a much healthier financial position. They can ride through the storm. And I'm thinking of a company like Amazon, obviously, which has seen its stock rise you know, over 20% since the crisis began. And they're providing essential services to the economy right now. And so that's fine, but very, very different corporate situations. So you have to see the corporate response in the context of the situation that they're in. And we've been very careful not to rush to judge who's just and who's unjust, who's good and who's bad, because the reality is executives, managers, business leaders are just grappling with incredibly difficult once in a lifetime challenges for how to keep their businesses um you know on a good path and get through this this crisis in one piece so everything i i you know we we talk about in terms of corporate actions i just want everyone to see it through that lens that's the reality of the conversations i'm having with leaders but in terms of real leadership you know let's if we look at an issue like um like workers you know, Starbucks, we thought, was um, was a real leader in the way it responded to the petition that one employee began. It, it, it garnered something in the region of 35,000 signatures, and it was really expressing concerns about health and safety of frontline workers. And, you know, as a result of that, Starbucks closed their stores, uh, provided a lot more, uh, you know, they really listened to their employees, responded at scale. And we felt like that was a great example of a company, you know, really reacting very quickly instead of trying to trying to sort of, you know, clamp down on 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 sort of public uh, uh, recognition of the of the challenges workers were expressing privately. You know, they embraced that, and we thought that was actually a a good a good sort of signal. Another one is on paid sick leave. You know, of the hundred largest employees uh, employers. We've seen something like 36 have announced new paid sick leave policies since the crisis began. The best, uh, or the, the, the certainly the longest that we've seen is Verizon at 40 days. And in fact, Verizon removed caps for backup care altogether and is providing an extra 100 bucks a day for employees who need that. Uh, and if we look at compensation, Amazon, I just mentioned Amazon is provided $2 an hour more. That's on par with Target and Walmart and Home Depot. Um, Starbucks did 3 bucks an hour more. 
Um, Amazon's always provide uh, also provided basically double their overtime rate. Um, that's you know that that's also strong for that retail sector. So you know we see we see lots of different kinds of leadership on different things depending on industry, depending on companies' own sort of health and situation. I think of Darden restaurants; they own Olive Garden. You know, Darden has now decided to um, make permanent its paid sick leave for its 180,000 employees. So this is not just going to sort of, you know, this, this is not just a temporary thing. This is now something we think will stick around for them. So that's really interesting. And it, it also begs the question, how many of these other sort of short-term interim uh, shifts that companies have made, how many of those will will stick around, you know, as we as we sort of go into the, the recovery? Yeah, I, I know that um, Microsoft was number one in your just 100 index and for many reasons. And I saw in your tracker um, that they are now paying 12 weeks of uh, parental leave benefits for those employees that are taking care of their kids at home. So I just thought that was another action, again, innovative, responsive, supportive by Microsoft. Um, that uh, certainly struck me. Um, I am curious, Martin, whether companies who have a crisp purpose that understand why they exist, such as a Microsoft, do you feel, or Starbucks, that they responded more precisely with nimbleness and sincerity to the coronavirus, to their core stakeholders? You know, if you know that there's a hurricane coming, you don't sort of begin to get your house in order as the hurricane is is approaching. You, you do it before then. You're, you're much better equipped to ride through the storm if you prepared ahead of time. And I think what we found is that companies that have embraced this idea of strong relationships with their stakeholders are more resilient. And they will be companies that have a better chance of making it through the crisis. Their initial signs are that financially, those companies have done better during the crisis. Our index has actually outperformed the, the, the benchmark by a great, you know, to a greater degree since the crisis began. We see top performers in every industry outperform bottom performers, uh, the laggards in every industry. By considerable margin, so I think what we'll find is that when the when the dust settles and we look back, top ranked companies who are doing all the things that we're just talking about will have outperformed their peers, and that that is another thing that will really begin to cause us to rethink what creates value and you know what kind of a marketplace we really need. You have been doing polls. Uh, with Harris. And um, they've had, I think, seven trackers to date. I don't know if you've been involved with all seven, but are there um, a number of key points that have really risen to the top um, for you? We're basically doing every week to 10 days, we're doing a wave of polling and we're now on our third wave. Um, we began really by just getting a sense from the public on, you know, just views on the corporate America, on corporate America's response. So how did, do people really think that companies were doing in responding to the crisis and uh, what kinds of issues people felt were most important? Uh, then we began to drill down a little bit on our second wave. We began to look much more closely at, you know, what, what actions companies should be taking and sort of getting a sense of the relative priorities of those actions, especially because we knew that the, Many companies were struggling with trade-offs, right? Do I, do I really, you know, you know, continue to retain workers, but I don't have the money, so I have to lower pay. So how do I do that whilst also providing better benefits, and such as paid sick leave? So really, really tough choices companies are making. So we wanted some guidance from the public, and then most recently, which we've just announced, is all on our website, uh, justcapital.com. We've been really looking at workers. And we asked a series of questions last week on how companies should be thinking about their workforce 
And in particular, um, you know, if they're taking, you know, uh, government relief money um, or if they're trying to make, uh, you know, decisions about how to prioritize the health and the safety of frontline workers, what kinds of issues matter. So a very sort of, I would say, a very um, detailed, granular guidance from the public on, you know, for any business leader who's who is really trying to, you know, figure out how to how to get through this. Clearly, people really are worried about their health. They're worried about the safety, their their safety, and also their family. So, the by far and away the most important set of issues is what is a company doing now to provide a safe workplace, for their frontline workers, providing PPE. That sort of overshadows everything else, including in some cases, you know, whether a company should be extending paid sick leave, uh, avoiding layoffs, um, you know, and keeping, you know, uh, other actions to keep a company in business. I, I guess that's the reflection of a of a public that is still very much afraid of the actual virus itself. And I, I've had the virus myself and I'm fine now, but, you know, it was pretty scary and I needed at least 10 days to begin to get back to normal. So when I look at that, I, I totally understand it. And I feel like 14 days, which is the minimum that the CDC recommends and that many companies are doing, but not all, you know, that's, it's, there are many companies less than that. Like you need at least 14 days to feel good enough to get back to work. And even then, um, you, you might still be able to pass it on. So, you know, Anyway, the point is that the, the health and safety issues are front and center in the polling at, at all times. Well, I'm glad to hear that that you've gotten over it. Um, I hope that your family also is well. Um, so uh, you're really important to our crusade for stakeholder based capitalism. So I'm I'm thrilled about that. Um, you recently on your website, you've got commentary on how to reopen the economy in a just and safe way. Um, I, I, you know, this is a microphone that can share your point of view with others. How do we do that? Because there's this, we know that our president wants to open things immediately. We've got states in the South that are opening this week. And there was also uh, an amazing, uh, I, I think, hashtag that talked about the the morons down in Florida being all over the beach. And I'm a Florida resident, so um, I'm not proud of what's going on down here because uh, I think that there's a lot more virus. So um, what are your suggestions to corporations to uh, how to reopen the economy in a just and safe way? My suggestions for companies is is first of all to listen to your workers and listen to the communities where you operate. I don't think the economy is going to open and reopen properly until people feel safe. That I think is crucial. It's going to be very personal reopening. And I mean that literally, individually, people will be more or less comfortable going into a store, getting on a plane, getting on a train, going back to the office. So I think that's going to be crucial. We see that in all our survey work and we see that many, many of the companies that we're talking to. What we've tried to provide with our tracker, with our polling, with our analysis and our blog and our principles is just a very concrete roadmap for companies to to do that, to think about how they can begin to build back up, but do that in what we would call a just way. So I, I think that's that's very tangible. But I want to say two other things about about the reopening. The first is Recession, economic recessions and depressions are deadly as well. We know that. Suicides, domestic violence, addiction. I mean, they all spike during economic recession. So we have to, we have to get back to work. Uh, so I said that in the article that, and my lead in the newsletter last week was it's really important that we, we have a plan for doing that. We can't reopen too soon because as I just said, People are still very worried about uh, their health and their safety in addition to their livelihoods. That balancing act, I think, is there's no magic formula for that, but we have to be really mindful of that of that balance. This is not a this is not a sort of a you know moment where the 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 air raid siren goes off and we all just come out of the shelter and now we're back to normal. That's not how it's that's not how it's gonna work. Another point is the virus and the crisis and the subsequent economic fallout are hitting different communities very, very differently. 
people of color, low income communities, they are really bearing the brunt of this. And that is, that is unjust. And it's unjust in a way that, uh, just undermines the kind of recovery that we need. My whole point about a, a just recovery was if we're going to come out of this with the kind of economic horsepower that we need, that we saw after the, after the Second World War, where we had four or 5% GDP growth, you know, we had a, we had a mountain of debt then, we have a mountain of debt now. Um, the only way that happens is if more people feel as though they have a stake in the outcome. And right, but you know, before this crisis, that wasn't the case. We had an economy that was rapidly exacerbating all the tensions of inequality. And I just, I, that to me is not a recipe to generate the kind of broad based buy in and, you know, the prosperity engine that made the middle class in America in the fifties and the sixties that gave more people the sense that they would benefit from their, from their labor. And that was just more inclusive. You know, people, people now, demand that and quite rightly so so i feel like this is a moment where we have a chance that we have to take not just for moral or just reasons but because economically we we we've got to get to a place where where more people feel like you know they're bought into this process and that to me is the essence of a of a just economy so if you had three, I mean, you've got so much wisdom here, Martin, but if you had three insights to share with corporate leaders listening to this or their teams who are advising them, what would you say to them? First of all, I would, I would really proactively seek the opinion of your key stakeholders and particularly your workers. I'd find out how the, maybe companies are doing this. I think it's really important right now to understand what they prioritize, what are they afraid of, what do they want, what's on their minds. That's, that's really crucial. I, I look at the work that PayPal was doing prior to this crisis. I think it's very important for companies to understand who are the financially most vulnerable of their workers and to come up with a plan for helping them get through this. I think that's concrete. It's something that, that every company can do. Uh, to the best of their ability, recognizing that, as I said earlier, many companies are in a tough spot. But just knowing the situation of your workers, I think right now is really important to be able to take insightful action. And then at a much higher level, I think this is the time for leadership. So I would be really urging CEOs, board members, and other sort of, you know, business leaders to be talking collaborative, collaboratively with your peers, um, with leaders of other stakeholder groups, policy, civil society, academia, to try and figure out what do we need to do to design uh, an operating model for stakeholder capitalism. If I'm a business roundtable CEO, and last August I signed that piece of paper, that statement, I know I'm going to be judged in August this year. And I better have a good story, and many will. And I, I, if my advice would be to just make sure you got your, you know, you understand precisely what does that operating model look like. How tangibly are you implementing measures and practices that show that you're walking the talk? Because I think coming out of this is going to be a lot of potential backlash for companies that got things wrong. You know, we, we're seeing large companies that don't need relief money uh, getting to the front of the line in the in the PPP, right? I mean, that's a perfect example of unjust behavior. I would say people are going to look back, and and your actions, you know, will be will be noted. And you want, you know, which side of the curve do you want to be on? And look, as the as the CEO myself of a small business, mm -hmm. um, I can just say how incredibly difficult it's been. I can't imagine being a business leader of a very large organization. It must be incredibly complex. And I, I want I'm, everything I've said, I, I just want to emphasize the amount of humility and respect I have for anybody in business right now. It's incredibly difficult operating conditions. You know, I'm incredibly proud of the Just team. You know, it, the work we've done is just phenomenal. But I, I just, I feel like it's a very, very difficult time. I talk to CEOs on our board, uh, former CEOs on our board, 
who say they've never seen anything like this. It's unprecedented. It's this is a this is the most challenging business leadership times they they've ever seen. So I just think it's it's very very important that we 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 keep talking to one another. We keep trying to figure out what does best practice look like. Can I do that? How can I get creative about the kind of partnerships that I need? That kind of thing. I think this is the time for real innovation. More time for that than it is for judgment uh, about who's good and bad. Because I, I I think that's that's not warranted at this point. Besides, the, 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 we're still in the middle of this thing. So. So I sort of feel as though that that sense of perspective is also very, very important. What do you feel is the future of purposeful companies and, you know, how they're engaging with society? Um, you know, you've talked about employees first and healthcare. I mean, from my standpoint, I'm seeing that there's a different set of issues. But I'm just curious about um, how will companies demonstrate their purpose going forward? That is the key question. My sense is that we are done talking, mm -hmm. that the lives and livelihoods on the line, yep. and that we now need to put this into practice, and it requires an operating model that, that uh, business leaders can get behind. What exactly are we talking about here? And this, you know, we're just going to start. This is how we measure our total stakeholder performance. This is how we measure purpose. This is the forward guidance we are providing to our stakeholders so that the world knows what our goals are and what we're doing in a concrete, quantitative way. Trust will be low. I think people will need to see and, and understand, you know, where companies are doing well or where they're failing. It's okay to fail if you're trying for, you know, authentically. These things are really, really hard. Um, you know, as someone smart once said to me, you know, just, just because you measure a problem, uh, that doesn't create the problem. You know, it's, it, we now need to begin measuring, uh, progress in this area. Well, well, Martin, it, it's always, um, an extraordinary conversation that I have with you. You have amazing wisdom. I have to tell you that, you know, you know that I showed up on your doorstep many years ago saying how <laughs> great you are. And I think that, um, you know, this pandemic has truly, I, I want to give kudos to your team because they have risen far above a high mark. Um, I know you're probably working 24 seven. I'm sorry to hear you were sick, but I'm glad that you got through it and we need you. Um, whether I say the purpose movement, the just capitalism movement, the stakeholder based movement needs the kind of work that you and the team are doing. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I am so thrilled that you are leading the organization and that all of your, colleagues are just so um, candid and profound and working so hard to shift our society. So on behalf of all of us that work in the world of purpose, all of the relationships I have, I want to give you a big thank you and a big virtual hug. Thanks, Carol. I, I, I'm, I'm hugging you now. Thank you so much for you've been a big supporter of our organization from the beginning, um, and your words about the team are absolutely true. It's 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 an amazing group, and uh, you know to do to do this under such tough conditions um, is just all, all the more incredible. But but you're absolutely right. What motivates us is the certainty that this is this is the the key period right now. This is going to define the next generation, and we sort of feel like we want to seize that you know, and capitalize on that as best we can, but really appreciate it. It's always good to be with you. Hey, I have one other question, which is a little bit, it's a cousin of what you're doing, but it has to do with the humanity that has come to the fore from individuals helping their neighbors, you know, shopping for, a, a, you know, an elderly person, um, maybe walking a dog. And um, we work with the folks at Points of Light and, um, you know, they are, really looking towards, you know, the power of people just to, to bring their humanity forward, going forward. Do you feel that there's going to be um, an opportunity for just this humanity and this neighborliness to continue um, once we get through uh, and go back to work? 
and try and rebuild our, our, our communities? At the end of the day, that's our choice. You know, I, I, I think uh, I was watching Howard Schultz on CNBC this morning talking about that, that exact thing, the humanity of business. It reminded me of our, our chair, Paul Tudor Jones, his TED talk back in February 2015. That's the word he used. This is about putting humanity back into markets. So, look, if it takes this pandemic to do that, um, it's sad. But, yeah, look, let's, let's at least try. Reba Dominski is EVP, Chief Social Responsibility Officer. And I'm sure you've been really busy during these very trying times, Reba. So tell us what U.S. Bank is doing to respond. For U.S. Bank, right away when COVID-19 hit, we started thinking about the ways that we could support our employees, our customers, and our communities. And so uh, within a week or two, we announced two programs, a premium pay program for our critical frontline employees and a $30 million commitment to community through our U.S. Bank foundations, as well as taking a number of actions to ensure that we were taking care of our customers through this unprecedented time. So really the focus immediately was how do we take care of our employees? How do we take care of our customers and how do we take care of the communities that we serve? And and it's interesting because the umbrella name for your community engagement is Community Possible. That's right. And and I'm curious, how did you, what levels of leaders and individuals within U.S. Bank came together? Um, How did you make decisions with speed and how did your foundational commitment to community possible give you greater clarity in a very unclear time? Absolutely. Well, I I think a lot of it, Carol, comes down to the fact that we use our purpose and our core values to guide our decisions every day. And they serve us incredibly well in crisis. And one of our core values that I turn to a lot is we put people first. And if you think about this time we're in, social distancing is necessary, but human connection is more important now than ever. So our first focus was on people. Another one of my favorite core values, you're not supposed to have favorites, but one of my other ones is um, is we do the right thing. So that really helped us as we think thought about the programs, the policies, the commitments we were making to employees, customers, and communities. So it all started with a set of core values, and then a senior leadership team that was organized very quickly in a way that allowed us all to communicate with each other very transparently and honestly to talk about what we were hearing and seeing from employees, from customers, from nonprofit organizations, and to rally around quick ownership of, okay, you take employees, you take customers, and then Reba, help us think about what that's going to look like for communities. And I did what I always do, which is I turned to my team. They are smarter than me. And I said, okay, we have an opportunity here. What should we do? And there were some long days and there were arguments and disagreements and there were very late nights. But at the end of about two days, we had a proposal that I thought, you know, this is remarkable. It's $30 million. It's pivoting where we are and what we were planning on doing and doing something completely different in light of COVID-19. So it was pretty remarkable how quickly we were able to move with purpose and core values and with a leadership team that was open to listening to how to do the right thing. And, and was that $30 million in addition to your ongoing commitments under Community Possible? It's a combination of new investments and pivoting existing investments. And if you'd like, I can kind of walk you through that $30 million commitment. Well, I'm just curious about how did you decide which ones were new and which ones were pivot? We actually pivoted everything. But I'll tell you, the way that we pivoted everything was trying to be very respectful of our nonprofit partners 
and trusting them to know what they need. So the Mm. biggest pivot for us is we took our grant budget, our community possible grant budget. It's about $15 million. And we said, we are giving those grants to nonprofits as general operating funds. So where we used to have about, boy, about 80% of our grant budget is programmatic. We said right now is not the time to question anything. Right now is the time to give to our nonprofits and again, say, we trust you. If you need these dollars to keep people employed, if you need these dollars to keep the lights on, if you need them to sustain you know, life changing philanthropy that you're doing in communities, whatever you need, we want to be here for you. So the biggest pivot for us was taking our entire budget and saying, we're going to put this out there as general operating grants for our trusted nonprofit partners. Really, really smart. Thank you. Um, Yeah. And I'm sure that you got um, some great feedback on that. I'm curious about your decisions to communicate what you were doing first internally then to your not-for-profits, and then to the public. How much communications did you have and how did you feel? What was the tone of it? Because I think there's a lot of questions about, do we even say anything? Or do we do a TV ad about, you know, honoring heroes? So how were those decisions made? Yeah, they were made in typical U.S. bank fashion, very thoughtfully with all the right partners at the table. And they evolved over time. You know, when we first put together our $30 billion commitment, it was a focus immediately on our internal teams. How do we want to communicate this to our teams that execute the grants, that partner with nonprofits? You know, part of our commitment is an increase in matching gifts for our own employees. We're doubling matches because we want our employees to be able to give in the way that that's meaningful to them. We also started a virtual volunteerism program that's been incredible. We're taking all of these volunteers that we have and we're moving them whenever possible into virtual volunteerism opportunities. So they're sewing cloth face masks. We have a virtual sewing circle. It's remarkable. Um, They are doing uh, financial literacy training online. They're doing e-mentoring. So again, we kind of started with, let's talk to our own employees. And then we pretty quickly moved to... How are we going to tell our story? I know, Carol, you're so well-versed in this, but brands will be judged on the actions they took to help, again, their employees, their customers, and their communities. And so we, it didn't take us long to say, you know what? We actually want to talk about what we're doing. And by the way, we don't just want to make the TV spot, which by the way, we have a phenomenal thank you TV spot that's out there right now. But we also want to make sure that we're talking to other companies, other uh, banks to say, what are you doing? How are you doing this most effectively? How can we collaborate and work together? Now is not the time for competition. It's the time for collaboration. So for those organizations who are still unsure of um, what they should do during COVID-19, they likely don't have a firmly stated purpose, if it won at all. Where do they start now since they're, they're playing catch up? Yeah, it's never too late. Um, I wish I could say we have all the testing we need. We have all the masks we need. We have, uh, we have the antidote and, you know, everything's going to go back. Um, first of all, I don't think anything will go back to business as usual. I think it'll be a new normal and it's never too late to step up. So my advice to other leaders who are navigating through this response is to be nimble, to be thoughtful, you know, listen and learn and collaborate with others, have an open mind to adjust and shift your programs and plans in a way that meets the greatest community needs. And then finally, um, be grateful for the work that we have the privilege of doing. I mean, we are in an unbelievable position as corporate social responsibility professionals where we can really make a difference in this crisis. And so as crazy as it sounds, we are so blessed to do this work of purpose. You know that. And I hope we always come back to the privilege we have and the gratitude we should experience from being able to make a difference in times like this. Very eloquently stated. I have a question about a post-COVID world. (laughs) <laughs> there has been, tr- yes, I always, I have a crystal ball. It still doesn't work. I've tried it for 30 <laughs> years. Um, but the question is the generosity, the, the empathy, the compassion 
that has been displayed, virtual volunteering or or helping a neighbor or such. Do you think that that's going to continue in some way in a post-COVID world? I think it has to, Carol. And I think we have to make it so. Um, because the the thing that keeps me up at night is thinking that we will come emerge from COVID-19 unchanged. Mm. We must. I mean, if you think about all the great movements in history, they have been precipitated by a crisis where people say, we can't go back to the way things used to be. So my hope is that we emerge from this crisis smarter, more creative, more compassionate. I think the inequities that COVID-19 has brought to light are inequities that have always existed in our systems. We're just talking about them and seeing them and they're in the press more. And so how are we going to work together to help create systems that help people and don't hurt people? If we don't take advantage of this situation to become better humans, Mm. then I think we've missed a critical opportunity. And if no one else will, and I know you and I will, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and there's a band of us that I think have to come together to say, we cannot just be unchanged. We have to be self-reflective. I've actually had my team um, journaling their experiences as they work from home because I've been amazed by their creativity. And so they're helping me think about as we come through this, how are we going to be different as a team? And I think if every leader does that, we will change as organizations and as people. What do you wish it would look like if we became a more empathetic and compassionate society? What would happen on the ground? Oh, that's such a good question. I think, let me, let me put this through, let me answer this through the corporate lens. I think for corporations, Carol, you know where many of us in this industry, in this field are headed, which is wanting to bring the full resources resources of our organizations to bear against communities' most pressing needs. You know, I was in the midst of a social impact strategy at U.S. Bank um, and in the midst of driving a lot of change. And COVID-19 could have made us stop, but it didn't. It actually made us accelerate our efforts because when you look at the disparity It's an easier argument to make with senior leaders to say, we have to do more for those who need us most. So for corporate America, I'm hopeful that we will be self-reflective and it will cause us to re-examine the difference between philanthropy and corporate social responsibility. And we will become more socially responsible global citizens. So I think for corporations, um, that's what could happen. I also think, um, you know, for nonprofits, I I hope it changes um, the nonprofit industry as well. And I'm not close enough to that industry to know how, but I've been reading a lot of the chatter on social media. And it seems like there are opportunities for everyone in this crisis to do things differently and and better. Uh, My favorite quote is Maya Angelou, once you know better, then you do better. We know better now. So you know what? We got to do better. Well, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. Just continue to do the amazing work that U.S. Bank is doing. You know, your heart's in the right place. You've got the business strategy intertwined. You're setting uh, a very high level of uh, performance for others to emulate. So thanks so much, Reva. Thank you so much, Carol. It is always a pleasure connecting with you and I appreciate those kind words. 